Hello and welcome back to Adapt H12. This week I'm joined by Amanda Pondani, who has written Weavers, Scribes, and Kings, which I'm of course holding up right here. And the topic of this week is the ancient near Middle East. And let's begin with this discussing the title for the book, Weavers, Scribes, and Kings. How did that come about? And tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, the title of the book represents the way that I'm approaching this history. Um, it's an overview of all of the ancient Middle East from the beginnings of cities to Alexander the Great. But what I wanted to do with the book was to focus on individuals and their life stories rather than doing a big sweeping overview of all of the political history. The political history is in there. That's why the term kings is in the title. But I also wanted to include people that we know a lot about who readers wouldn't necessarily have encountered before. People like weavers who were producing the textiles that were really important to the economy and the scribes who kept track of all of the records of the, the kingdoms and also of, of private individuals that they worked for. I could have put a lot more professions in the title, but my editor sort of stopped me with the three because there's also so many other people in the book, obviously beyond weavers, scribes and kings. But it um, it's a different approach to looking at a big sweep of history by really delving into the lives of the people who were alive at the time and what they experienced. So it's a social history as well as being a political history. And I would begin in the third era period, this is perhaps what most people are familiar with. With. So let's begin there and talk about the uh, third dynasty of uh, which is famously called. Yes, the third dynasty of Ur. Um, This is a time at the end of the third millennium BCE, so uh, the sort of 2100s um, BCE, when there was a dynasty at the city of Ur that was. Um, Remarkable in many ways. Uh, the, this was a kingdom that extended over a considerable amount of what is now Iraq. And the kings who ruled in Ur um, created some really important innovations, one of which was that they uh, are apparently responsible for the first laws that were written down. A lot of people think this was Hammurabi, who was a later king who uh, created law, but he didn't. We'll talk about later. Yes, right. Um, no, the first king that we know of who, who wrote down laws was a king named Ornama. And he was um, uh, possibly not even thinking of himself as a lawgiver as much as he was consolidating a list of legal precedents and portraying himself in a way that was um, quite strikingly uh, interested in his population. So whereas one might think of the sort of classic ancient king uh, as a warmonger. Um, Ornama wasn't. He portrays himself as someone who was good to his people. In the prologue and the uh, to his laws, he describes himself as someone who doesn't allow the weak person to be um, uh, manipulated by the strong person. That he is on in sort of the on the side of the poor. Uh, he if, also, if even... I may, how much do we know that this is propaganda? That we really can, I mean, of course, it's probably impossible to find out today, but do you know how much this is, is really yeah. true that he writes about himself? Every, every royal inscription is propaganda. So, you know, anytime we're taking the king's words for what they did, we have to take it with a grain of salt. What's interesting about Ornama is that that's what he wants to be thought of as. You know, it's his... It's an ideal kingship. He probably didn't live up to that in the sense that he was someone who conquered other regions, but he doesn't make a big deal about that in his inscription. And there's a big stele, um, parts of which survive, a big stone monument from the reign of Ornama. And on it, he portrays himself, uh, there's a number of registers of images, and he portrays himself as very pious. He stands before the gods. He gives libations to the gods. The gods are awarding him with kingship in a sort of symbolic way. And on one layer of the stele, it shows him um, as a builder, as someone who was, a, was building um, possibly temples to the gods, but doesn't seem to show uh, a, a war scene on this inscription. So yes, certainly he was a military leader, but the fact that he chooses to 
portray himself as someone who was a good guy is, is interesting. I think in terms of independent evidence for his reign, a lot of the independent evidence for his reign comes from administrative texts and also for the reign of his son, Shulgi. And they were certainly um, very, their, their kingdom was very, very well organized. There are more documents from the third dynasty of Ur, the so-called Ur III period, um, for a 50-year period than there are for almost any other era of Mesopotamian history. These cuneiform documents on clay that survive in the ground, there are hundreds of thousands of them. And at least 100,000 of those are from this very short 50-year period, mostly in the reign of Shulgi, in fact. And so they have had a really powerful impact on our understanding of the ancient Middle East because we have so much information. So we know how the taxes were paid. We know that there were governors in the various cities. We know about the redistribution um, system that they had. And sometimes it's possible for scholars to track the career of a single official um, through these documents, or that he can even track a particular um, group of goats who were sent to a place called Puzrish Dagan, which was the, the center for distribution. So there's an enormous amount that can be studied about this period. And, you know, it's interesting you ask that question because very often for the whole 3000 years that I cover in the book, we know more about how the administration worked or how the people lived than we necessarily know about the lives of the kings. If the kings weren't writing letters, um, if all we have from them are their royal inscriptions, as you say, we have to kind of read past the propaganda aspect of those royal inscriptions. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily know a great deal about their lives and their courts. In some cases, though, for later, for example, there's a king named Zimri Lim, who lived in the 18th century BCE. And his archives have been found in his palace, including vast amounts of correspondence. And so for him, we know the names of his wives, we know so much about him, but for some of these other kings, lesser. It's fascinating that we have so much documentation and how it just got to show how interesting people were in actual documenting from even early civilization that we still know so much about even this thing that happened 4,000 years ago. Yes, yes, exactly. I think that's something that's often not understood and not well known among the, the general reading public is that because these documents were written on clay, which doesn't disintegrate, we don't just have the documents that they wanted us to have that would be carved on stone or that might be recopied. We have things that are just letters between, you know, a man and his brother saying, meet me on such and such a day by the river and we'll go on our trading expedition. You know, we have so many things like that. But that's like a that. fascinating stuff though. At least to me it is. That's oh, it's absolutely. People. Yeah, no, that was, that was why I wrote the book is that the everyday people really do jump out of these documents in such an interesting way. Of course, the people who wrote the letters were not necessarily the people who actually did the writing were not necessarily the person who was sending the letter because most people were illiterate. So they had to hire a scribe to write a letter. Mm -hmm. And if you were rich enough to hire a scribe, you probably weren't in the, the, the very um, sort of poorest levels of society. But even those very poor people often received rations. They often were called up for labor duty. And so we have their names and we have some mm -hmm. sense of their lives as well. It's almost as we know more about everyday people in earlier civilization than we do about later, say, in Roman times, where we mostly know about only the elite, because the history writers only wrote about the elite, and they always, on, up until modern day, pretty much, elite was always the focus. But as we have the ancient Middle East, we know, like I said, we know more of them, about, and we talk about, we're going to talk about this more, of course, but we know more about everyday people than we do in later times. We, Almost at least in the Roman era, of course, I have archaeological evidence in it, just but right. still we know more about the elite than we do in the common people. But it's almost flipped the coin in, in a way, to put it that way. In a way, yes. And I think the other big difference between the classical Greek and Roman civilizations and the ancient Middle East is that they had developed the um, idea of writing history, you know, of writing a history of, so you have, you know, Herodotus and Thucydides and Tacitus and Suetonius and so forth, who give us a big narrative about what the, what was important. And in some ways, the 
the, the surprising thing about the, the ancient Middle East is that we d because we don't have that, in some cases, we can discover an entire kingdom that wasn't known before because nobody had excavated and there was no ancient Middle Eastern Herodotus to tell us who the, the big powers were. And so there's a lot of detective work involved in this. And there are, uh, for example, the kingdom that I have written the most about in my scholarly research, which is a kingdom called Hana, we know the names of the kings, we don't know a great deal about them, but we have this neighborhood of people who lived in one of the cities where we can talk about all of their relationships and their cousins and their brothers and their fields and so forth in much more detail than we can really say anything about the, the kings themselves. Now, another thing you begin your book with is across a civilization rise of cities need to build. So let's talk a little bit about the city builders and early city development in the Sumerian period as well. Okay, um, so this is before this. Uh, so we were right, talking about the right. Third Dynasty of Earth. This is going back now to about 3500 BC, so about 1400 years earlier than that. You get the beginnings of what are recognizably cities. Um, and the date of the beginning is if that is is very subjective in terms of what you define as a city. But I chose to start the book around 3500 BCE with the city of Uruk, which is very far south in, in Mesopotamia, like um, the city of Ur, which is also in the south. But Uruk is often seen as the world's first city. Now, is that true? We don't know because, of course, we haven't excavated every possible ancient city. But for now, it does seem to be of, uh, of the cities in Mesopotamia, the earliest and the biggest. And it's it's a remarkable place because you have, and a remarkable time, actually. This period is called the Uruk period, and it lasted from 3,500 to maybe um, 3,100, and then there's a little change. But between that, sort of those 400 years, the number of transformations is really remarkable. There, there were technological innovations. There were increasing numbers of people living in one place. There was an organization that developed in order to, as you say, the builders, right? The, the city had to be built and they had to have an organization in order to bring in all of the workmen and maybe work women as well, who did the construction, who did the um, uh, the planning, who brought in the materials from other cities. All of this took place and it took place before they were they, before they had a writing system, which I think is the really remarkable aspect of this, that the beginnings of the city of Uruk were, um, they were somehow organized by people who were clearly bringing in hundreds and hundreds of workmen, but with an administrative system that depended not on writing, but on a, a system of, there were a number of different possibilities of how the system was organized, but they had, before they had writing, they had these clay tokens that were a way of keeping track of numbers and commodities. And it seems as though these clay tokens were some part of that administration. But increasingly, they came to need a writing system. And so we see one of the most important things about the Uruk period is that writing did develop by around 32, 3100 BCE. They had a writing system for exactly this reason. They needed to keep track of the administration. And so they started recording it in mostly just lists of numbers and commodities, but but on clay tablets. And so that's another thing that happened. But it's um, there was also, this was the time when they developed the idea of sealing clay with cylinder seals. These are these um, cylinder shaped seals with, with patterns on them that you can roll on clay that would identify perhaps who had sent something, who had received something, who had sealed a pot, who had sealed a door. They had the beginnings of monumental architecture, um, city walls, uh, temples to the gods. Temples had always existed in earlier times, but they had these enormous temples that seemed to have been constructed by, by hundreds and hundreds of people. And, um, and it all happens in what is, I mean, 400 years seems to us a long time, but 400 years in comparison with the amount of time that had come before this was really fast. Yeah. And even the, the style of art that developed at the time became consistently used throughout Mesopotamian history in many ways. Um, the, the structure of the administration that they developed also had lasting impact as well. So that period is really, really exciting in terms of, of all of the developments that took place at the time. Another thing, I want to discuss 
the writing art itself and the cuneiform, for cuneo for because of course as most people probably are aware or maybe not but this was this the writing art form wasn't really deciphered until we discovered the Rosetta Stone which of course is now in because of course it is in the British Museum so that's this just the art form of cuneiform itself and of course how they decide how we finally were able to decipher and and how would yeah. that change change the history of the ancient Near East? Well, the decipherment, the, the Rosetta Stone is for Egyptian hieroglyphs. There aren't any oh. any cuneiform on oh, that. So, yeah, sorry but, if I missed up a little bit. So. No, no worries, no worries. They had there's a similar inscription though in Iran called the Bisatun inscription. It is much much bigger. It's on the side of a mountain, but like the Rosetta Stone, it has an inscription in several languages. Um, in Old Persian, in Elamite, and in Akkadian. And uh, it was written in Persian times by Darius I, but it is this enormous um, uh, mountainside inscription. It was very hard to reach. Uh, it was reached um, in the 19th century. They took uh, copies of it. They made paper um, peels of the, of the inscription. And it was a team effort. The uh, number of people worked towards the decipherment. But by the 1850s, it was it was deciphered. And that made it possible then for scholars to um, to read, especially importantly, the ancient language of Akkadian, which was the one that was used in the period that that um, of the of the uh, um, height of the of the ancient Middle East. Uh, it was also then made possible to decipher an earlier language, which is called Sumerian and um, Sumerian was written before Akkadian. It isn't exactly early. I, I said that word, and as it was coming out of my mouth, I realized it's it's not quite that. Akkadian and Sumerian were both spoken in very early times. We don't know how early because it was before writing. But Sumerian was written down before Akkadian was written down. And so the, Sumer the cuneiform writing system developed to write uh, Sumerian. And then later it was adapted to write the language of Akkadian, which was also spoken in Mesopotamia. They were both completely unrelated languages that were spoken in Mesopotamia. And it's because in some ways um, it developed first as a script to write whole words, it has some very distinctive aspects to it. One of which is that throughout the time that cuneiform was written, there were some signs that you could read as a whole word. So you would see a sign for a star and you could read that as dingir, which is the word for God. So that word God could always be depicted by the sign for a star. But gradually over time, they also started using it as a phonetic system as well, as a syllabary, so that each sign stood for a syllable. And it was often, almost invariably, the syllable of the word that is that word in Sumerian. So, for example, an arrow, uh, the word for arrow was T. And so if you wanted to write the sound T, you could write a picture of an arrow. And that made it possible then for the language to be, any language really, to be written in cuneiform because you have these syllable signs. Mm. However, because it isn't an alphabet, it's not a sign for every consonant and every vowel, it's a sign for every possible syllable. It means that there were always at least you needed about 150 signs to be able to write anything. And there were often about 600 signs in use. They were some of them were very unusual um, and not widely used. But there's, you know, and certainly actually even at the earliest period in the Uruk period when they first invented the writing system, that was the time when it had the most signs and they actually whittled some of them away because there were so many. But that's 600. So it's not an easy system to learn for a scribe. It's not like learning an alphabet where you have 24 to 26 signs and then you've you've got it. It's a pretty complicated system. I think it's maybe a bit tad bit too complicated to me, and so maybe a bit too late to learn now. But it's there was something something else I want to talk about is about the royal tombs of her, and this might be a silly question, but can it be compared to in a way the same way the function in Egypt, the Egyptian royal tombs that we know? The, oh what, yes, that's the value. I do forgive me, the name is great right now, but the value of the tombs, I believe. Can they be compared in that way? Or did they have the same function? They did. I mean, they were places to bury kings, obviously. Um, and like the... I mean, both re I mean, both religiously or you know, burial rituals in that way. Yes. Yes and no. There's, there's a big similarity and there's a big difference. In Egypt, there seems to have always been a belief that the afterlife was going to be glorious. 
the afterlife was somewhere that the kings especially were going to be joining the gods and they um they they there was no sort of sense of of dread of the afterlife i think in egypt and once you got past the weighing of the heart you know there's this thing in the in the new kingdom in the um the book of the dead where the heart your heart was weighed against a feather of of the goddess mart and if you made it through that then you went to this glorious afterlife the mesopotamians were much less sure that the afterlife was a good place when they wrote about it very little when they did write about it they tended to think it was dark it was gloomy um, it was a place where you ate dust, uh, where you wore feathers, um, you never saw the light. So it wasn't a place they were apparently looking forward to, at least to read the, the mythology. However, they did believe that people still alive could make your afterlife better by continuing to provide your tomb with gifts and with food and, and drink. And that they shared with Egypt. So both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, the, the tombs of family members would continue to receive food and drink. Um, for the afterlife. And the, in Mesopotamia, the more children you had, apparently the better afterlife you got because uh, that was a, a perhaps a sign that you would be taken care of. But that said, both in both civilizations, kings were buried with great riches. And in both civilizations, almost every tomb you find is has been robbed, has long since lost its, its wealth. Except for King Tutankhamun, of course, in Egypt, whose tomb in, was discovered in 1922 with enormous wealth. And these royal tombs of Ur were kind of the equivalent in Mesopotamia, also found in the 1920s, also made an enormous impact on the world. You know, they were announced with, with uh, front page news in, in headlines across the world uh, because they were spectacularly wealthy. The, the um, kings and queens, they queens were buried separately from the kings and they also had enormously wealthy burials from just this one very short period around maybe 24 24 50 bce these tombs were um uh dug and were, and the and the kings and queens were buried and then after that we have really no intact royal tombs until the neo assyrian period where there's uh, much much later hundreds and hundreds of years later where there are some royal tombs of princesses that have been found. But that's why the, the tombs at Ur are so fascinating because they give us this insight into the amount of wealth that kings and queens would have been buried with. One big difference though, from later tombs was that in this very early period, each of these royal family members was buried, most of them, not all of them, most of them were buried with attendants who had been sacrificed at the time of the funeral. Um, it used to be thought when they were first discovered that each of the attendants uh, took poison voluntarily and died. But more recent studies of the skeletons have shown that actually the people seem to, they may have taken poison to numb themselves, but they were, they, their skulls were cracked in. So they seem to have been killed to accompany the king or the queen to the afterlife. And this was a very short-lived phenomenon we know that they didn't do this later, that uh, there's no evidence later for this kind of um, royal sacrifice. Um, but it was true in Egypt as well, very, very early in Egypt. Uh, mm. The very first, uh, before the time of the New Kingdom, before even the time of the Old Kingdom, their two attendants were buried with the kings and their two, the practice stopped. So for whatever reason, in both places, about the, the same, you know, uh, the same time when you just have the beginnings of kingship, these kings seem to have commanded their attendants to be buried with them, and and later that stopped. Now, of course, it will be always criminal if when we're talking about Iraq and the Sumerian period, not to mention, of course, the epic of Gilgamesh, which is a tale as old as the Cuneiform tablets. So let's this just the import the the epic. It's an the story of, of the epic of Gilgamesh. Yes. Okay. So Gilgamesh was probably an actual person. We don't know for sure um, because there are no inscriptions from his own time, but he would have been a king in what's called the early dynastic period. And that is between the Uruk period where the first cities developed and the third dynasty of Ur when we have those first laws. So he would have lived perhaps around 2,500, in fact, possibly even right around the same time as those royal tombs in Ur. He was supposedly a king of Uruk. We don't, as I say, have any inscriptions from him from his own reign, but we do have evidence of people who were named in the stories about Gilgamesh 
having been actual historical people. So he might have been a real historical person. But over time, the stories about him got more and more elaborate. He became a mythical figure um, who was considered to be partly divine, you know, that he wasn't just a human being and that he had these terrific adventures. And in the early period, in that um, third dynasty of Ur, for example, and in the um, subsequent period of the early second millennium BC, most of the stories about Gilgamesh were separate. There was a story about him and his servant Enkidu and their adventures. And then there were stories about his conquests of different places. Now, at some point, maybe around 1800, 1750 BCE, someone came along and put these stories together into an epic, an epic poem. We don't have, unfortunately, most of that epic poem. We have a later version of it which was all the way later in like the 13th century. So gosh, um, at least a thousand years after Gilgamesh's lifetime, probably more like 1200 years after his lifetime, this epic poem was put together. And it was put together by a man named Sin Leki Unini. And he, like Homer, you know, he, he, he signed his, his uh, version of the epic. And it's a fascinating story because it really is the world's oldest epic poem. And it tells a story of this man, Gilgamesh, who was, uh, he was a very powerful king and it sets him back in his time, back in the, the early dynastic period, who was um, troublesome to his population in that he was always sort of getting the young men fired up and he was apparently sleeping with the young women. There's some question about the translation, but he was he was someone who was, who was difficult. And the epic describes the elders of the, city of Uruk getting together and pleading with the gods, you know, do something about this, this Gilgamesh, he's too much trouble. And so the gods created a friend for Gilgamesh, whose name was Enkidu. And there's a long story about how Enkidu comes to be civilized. He's initially a very wild man. He comes into the city, becomes civilized. And he and Gilgamesh then set off on adventures. And Enkidu and Gilgamesh um, initially go off to kill a monster named Humbaba, who lived in the Cedar Forest. And the whole story is in a way, it's about a lot of things, but one of the things it's about is immortality. And Gilgamesh wants immortality right from the beginning of the story. And when he starts out, he thinks he's going to get his immortality by getting a name for himself so that his name will live forever. And so he does all of these things to try and become immortal by uh, being remembered. But they become more and more troublesome to the gods, these, these, this couple, Gilgamesh and, and Enkidu, until the gods eventually are sick of it. And the goddess Inanna asks for help from her father, um, and he's going to send the bull of heaven, which is going to kill the two of them. But they manage to kill the bull of heaven. So again, they're, they're sort of being causing real trouble for the gods. So the way the gods punish Gilgamesh is not to kill him, but to kill his best friend Enkidu. And Enkidu dies. And Gilgamesh then becomes obsessed with not just having a name for himself, but living forever, literally. He wants to, to live, to be immortal like the gods. And even though he's part god, apparently that doesn't give him immortality. So he, he sets off in this pursuit. Now, there's this wonderful part of the epic in the older version, which Sinleke Onini left out, but I think it's, it's just fascinating. And that is that he arrives at an inn and there's an innkeeper there. And the innkeeper is a woman, which was common, um, and she gives him advice. And she tells him, this immortality you're looking for, you won't find it. The gods created immortality for themselves and death for human beings. You are going to die, she tells him. So give up on this quest, she basically tells him. Go back to your wife, go back to your children, enjoy good music, enjoy feasting, enjoy um, being clean, she says, because she said that's the lot of human beings. And I think that is also a moral of the story. You know, it's it's a fascinating. There's so many morals to this story about friendship, about immortality, but especially this idea that even this great, powerful king should um, sort of uh, what people say, you only live once. Right. I mean, it's that's the story. It's like this is your life. You need to go and live it and not waste your time searching for immortality. Well, he completely ignores her. He doesn't do that. He goes on looking and he finds eventually this man who's named Utnapishtim. And Utnapishtim is the only human being who has immort immortality in their belief system. He was human. He's now immortal. 
but he got it in a very singular way, and that is by surviving the flood. And at that point, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh in the 11th tablet, it's in, in 12 tablets, in the 11th tablet, it then goes into a flood story, which for anyone who's familiar with the Bible is, is the story of Noah, just told in a different way. Um, Utnapishtim is the Noah character. He builds an ark. He suffers through a storm. Um, he takes animals onto the boat with him, not two of each, but animals, all the animals in the world. Uh, he has his family there. The flood comes. It wipes out all of humanity, all of life. He lands on a, a mountain. If I may, there are yeah. very simple uh, for the British Museum post. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but he posted a video a few days ago on the British Museum where he found this map of that is considered to be the first world map where you can supposedly see the real very good video and they added to the description where you can actually see the are supposed in in their imagination it's where you can see the arc of Noah if you walk to this mountain you can still see the arc of Noah. So mm. if I made a mere video where you show this map that where where the arc supposedly stranded. It's a super fascinating video and fascinating, of course, yeah. It's it's everything think so it's a, it's really good. Um, oh uh, yes, I mean, he's I very recommend good. That video, so it's a, it's a, well, it's a, from my understanding, and I'm in the wrong, but it's, what well, it's supposed to be, be the world's first map, I believe. Interesting. Irving Finkel is the expert on this. He's written a whole book about um, the Ark and the, the flood story and so forth. So, no, he would be the right person to, to have. Anyway, so the uh, moral yeah. of the story. I just though, wanted to add this little. No, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is that. Utnapishtim, having told this whole story to Gilgamesh about how he survived because the gods let him and then the gods gave him immortal life at the end because he had survived. Um, he points out to Gilgamesh, sort of, I did that. You can't do that. You, there's, there's no flood for you to survive. But he says, I do have this plant I could give you, which would make you young again. And you can go and find this plant. And he gives the directions to Gilgamesh to find the plant. Gilgamesh finds the plant. And then he foolishly leaves it at the uh, edge. Of, he goes swimming. He leaves the plant. The plant is stolen by a serpent. Um, the serpent then sheds its skin and becomes young again. And Gilgamesh has lost his chance, even at re sort of reliving uh, another lifetime. He ends up not, not getting any form of eternal life. But the very end of the epic describes him coming back to Uruk and being proud of what he's achieved, almost as though he's gone back to that sort of idea of, well, they will remember me because of all of the good things I've done, rather than being able to actually live forever. It's a fascinating um, account. It's not complete. They haven't found all of the tablets. So if um, someone wanted to read it, I would suggest finding something called a translation rather than something called a paraphrase, because if the book says it's a paraphrase, they tend to fill in the parts that aren't there. If you've got a translation, the the uh, translator will say, you know, this part we don't have, we just will skip on to the next part. And then you're getting all that we know rather than something that might have been um, invented by a modern author, although the paraphrases can be wonderful too. There is two extra tablets of the book. I read the epic in the last few years ago and I, I don't remember the author's name it's behind me but i don't remember the author's name they mentioned that there are two extra tablets within 12 or 11 and 12 or 12 13 and i don't remember exactly but there are kind of in a way two sequels tablet that to the book or appendix if you will tablet 12 is often seen as an appendix yeah that 11 is a doesn't quite fit the whole flood story, you know, in a sense in that it goes into a completely different voice. And it was apparently an addition. Um, the Gilgamesh stories, the earlier Gilgamesh stories, um, don't seem to have had a flood. And the flood story does seem to have been added, but it's still considered part of the, the epic. Yeah, Tablet 12 doesn't quite fit with the rest of it. But um, you may be talking about Andrew George's yeah, uh, that's, publication. That's really, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he wrote a uh, he did a translation of all of the different known uh, stories relating to Gilgamesh and put them in a, a publication. Then that's that's a helpful one to look at. Yeah. Now, of course, another thing that is part of your book, of course, is the women in the ancient Near East. So let's talk about women. And um, I want to begin with every it is the everyday life of women before we go into royal princesses. So let's begin with those who went to royal birth and the common woman in in the ancient Near East. So let's discuss, of course, as you, as we say, we have a lot of tablets to go on. So now, what do we know about the ancient Near East? Well, you know, it's fascinating because um, when I set out to write the book, I was aware of how many women we knew about and how little um, they have been 
discussed really in works for a general audience. You know, they've been discussed a lot by scholars. And so one of my goals was just to get exactly this information out to the world because what we we know an enormous amount about women's lives because they too were hired by the palaces and the temples. They were listed on ration lists. They hired scribes to write letters. Um, they had all kinds of professions. Uh, it was, it was a, a world in which um, certainly it wasn't a situation where women were the equals of men in society, but they had a lot of um, roles and responsibilities to play that are not necessarily true in other ancient cultures. So, for example, in early times, uh, women could own land. Throughout Mesopotamian history, this was true. They could own land. They could pass it on to their children. They could um, go to court. They could take people to court. They could be witnesses in court. Uh, they could um, own businesses uh, They and did own businesses. They were, as I mentioned, innkeepers. Innkeepers were very often women. Um, there were priestesses who were enormously powerful and they were you know they would run the temple as the the ceo of the temple would be a woman in that case so there was a lot of um options open to women that were not necessarily true even in greece and rome curiously mm -hmm. uh, and we also know that they of course had families um uh, women tend to marry younger than men did uh they would generally marry soon after reaching adolescence. As in every single civilization before modern times, they had a lot of children because they weren't easy ways of um, uh, easy forms of contraception. Uh, there were some, but it was not uh, not simple. And so they had big families and a lot of children died. And again, that was true till modern medicine. That's not just Mesopotamia, that's just world history. Uh, life expectancy was short for both men and women. So women often died in childbirth um, or of disease or of illness. Men often died, uh, also died of illness and, and injuries. Maybe not childbirth. In not in childbirth. Men, men were not dying in childbirth. But, but aside from the childbirth, many of the same uh, afflictions resulted in people having life expectancy if they made it through, uh, through childhood of maybe 40, 35 or 40. And there were some people, of course, who lived to grand old age. It's not that nobody lived to be 100. People did. But that was a huge exception to the rule. So someone who was that elderly was considered to be very, very wise <laughs> and very, very old. Um, but um, well, but what's no, the it... average life? As the, as, so I'm 30 now. So I'm turning 30. Was that like the average life expectancy? Or what, well, what was the, we know that some, at least in Roman times, if you live past my age, you would nor usually naked to old age. Was this the case in ancient Near East as well? That if you live past, say, 30, 29, 30, you, you would have a good chance of growing old. I believe that I was the case in Roman times. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think that, um, um, I mean, this is based, this is based on archaeology and I'm not an archaeologist, so I don't want to, I mean, Obviously, I use a lot of archaeological material in my in my work, but I am not physically an archaeologist. Um, the life expectancy, I think, is based on skeletal remains. Mm. And I don't know that that's true, actually, in ancient Mesopotamia, that if you made it past sort of 40, you, you could live to be 80. And because the same diseases would affect you. Mm. Certainly, you wouldn't at that point be dying in childbirth and you wouldn't be dying in war, probably, because they probably weren't sending out um, older people and, and women wouldn't be having children at that point. So yes, those causes of death would go away. But disease, epidemics, um, just an injury, if you get an infection in, in a cut, they had no way of stopping that from becoming infected. And they had terrible teeth. You know, people who were older had these abscesses on their teeth and stuff because they had also, I mean, one of the problems with, with bread at that time is all bread was ground on stone grinding stones. And that meant that there was constantly sand in your bread because of the, the ground stone that got into the bread and it ground down people's teeth. So they would get terrible, terrible dental problems and people could die of you know dental diseases. So I don't think that you were definitely guaranteed to, I'm, I'm pretty certain it was, um, the average life expectancy is average because it was it was average. It was very, very rare to live to be really old. And actually, no, I do have another reason why I know that um, from the texts. 
because we have censuses. And there's a census in the Neo-Assyrian period, really interesting one, of tenant farmers who lived um, and who were growing grapes. And they dis the, the tenant farmers were listed in this census as to who was living in a household. And almost, almost none of the households included grandparents. They were parents and children. And that suggests that very few people live to be grandparents. Hmm. Something else I want to ask, because, you know, as, as at least later in our in uh, ancient as well as when Christianity appears, virginity was very much uh, valued. And what was it the same in ancient Near East as well? Like virginity where validity were a virgin before marriage that was, it, or did people not care if you had sexual relations before marriage? Was that it? Was that an important no, part of ancient Near East? It was important. You can see that in the laws. Um, one proviso about the laws is that they weren't necessarily followed to the letter, but it was um, it was that they, they made distinctions between rape of a woman who was betrothed, who clearly was apparently, you know, um, still a virgin. Um, there was definitely uh, there was an emphasis on that, and of course, I mean, this is a patriarchal society. And it was very important to the husband to know that his children were his own children. And so a lot of that was, um, I think a lot of this emphasis was based on the idea of being sure of paternity. And so, yeah, there, was, there were much um, stricter rules about adultery for women than there were for men. So a man could have concubines. It rarely did a man have a second wife. Sometimes they did, but they, they could visit concubines and prostitutes and so forth and that was not considered adultery but a woman having any sort of sexual relationship outside her marriage was considered to be adultery mm. and that was obviously because of paternity so that um so that the man's the, the people he was recognizing as his children were indeed his children mm. now what now what about the royal princesses and queens in this era let's talk about how marriage alliances and so forth and what's it like and again to do another comparison to the early to medieval and, and, and ancient times was it like you know how they, they kept it within the family as the Ptolemies did or was it if you marry my my daughter you we would have, we would have an alliance with say Babylon and Persia for, for just an example not just you know yes. or Europe or another kingdom was the was the this kind of alliances and what what a role of a princess slash queen in the ancient Near East. Yeah, it was a really important role. Um, and nothing like Egypt. They didn't marry their sisters. Uh, this was, it was the one of the primary ways that a king would make an alliance was to have his daughter marry his ally or, or to marry his ally's daughter or both. You know, I mean, they, they um, both were recognized as a sort of uh, way of cementing that tie between them. And they did it a lot. They did it from the earliest records we have. So in the city of Ebla, which is 2300 BCE in Syria, there's a, an archive in the um, palace there, which shows that the king of Ebla was marrying his daughters to his vassals. He was marrying daughters to, off to his allies. And those women then become... It's, it's partly that they, you know, yes, they've joined their two households, right? The, the, they would say this, that my house has become your house because we are uh, now kin. We are brothers-in-law or father-in-law, son-in-law, or however it works. But um, the, the other aspect of it was that they now have a spy in the court of their ally or their vassal. And these women would write letters back to their fathers recounting what's going on in their kingdom. So it wasn't sort of a matter of sending the girl away and she's like, they, it, when it was first discussed, they would just say, it's just like a, another gift. You've sent you, you've sent uh, gold and you've sent a daughter and that's just like another gift. I don't think so at all. Um, the evidence suggests that you are sending someone who is actually now becoming almost your ambassador in that other place or one of your ambassadors. And she is going to be um, really representing her father in her husband's court and representing her husband's um, sort of requests to her father. So she's playing this very, very important role. And these marriages continued unabated for thousands of years, that they continued to have diplomatic marriages in which the daughters would be, the, obviously the daughter had no say in it. She was sent. 
but she then becomes someone who has this powerful role in her husband's court. And an example of this, again, going back to the kingdom of Mari that I mentioned before from the 18th century BC, BCE in, um, in Syria, the, the king of Mari, Zimri Lim, had a wife named Shibtu, who was in fact one of these princesses from an ally's court. And she then is playing not just a role with respect to her father, she also was in charge of the, she was in charge of the court when Zimri Lim went away. So he left her in, in a position of authority. So she really was in some ways a, almost a co-ruler with him, as well as being someone who was uh, part of a diplomatic arrangement. Hmm. Now, Nanette, do you know what to talk about? I'm going to talk about Babylon in, in a few minutes, but I want, before that, I want to talk about what is known as, and I want, I want to ask about it, about it this as well, Assyria, of course, and I want to ask, is uh, because Assyria is known as the world's first empire, and is this the case? And can we call it? Because in I read read one read a book about Assyria a while ago, and there it is even discussed there. Can we consider Assyria an empire? Let's so let's just talk a little bit more about Assyria and what is really the world's first empire. Ah, oh, that is such a good question, um, and could take a whole book to answer that one. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is. It depends how you define an empire. A lot of people will say that there really wasn't an imperial, as an effective imperial system until the time of the Assyrians. If I may add to that, was rather a commonwealth than an empire. Sorry, what was? I'm sorry, was it rather mention. a commonwealth rather than an empire? Mm, no, um, no. It was, there were territorial states that had sort of imperialistic ambitions before the Assyrians. And so you often see Sargon, for example, all the way back in 2300 BCE, being described as the first emperor, the first king who managed to build an empire. And to some extent, I think there is some truth to that. He managed to bring a lot of different regions with different languages and different cultures under a single government. And his empire lasted for about three generations, maybe four generations, but then it collapsed. And the problem was is that he had he and his successors had to keep reconquering the regions that they'd already conquered because they didn't have an effective way of maintaining the empire once the, the troops left. And that continued to be a problem. So the third dynasty of Ur that we talked about, that too has sometimes been described as an empire. Uh, Hammurabi, his kingdom in the 18th century BCE, again, people say perhaps that was an empire. And you can, you can argue it both ways, but none of them were particularly successful. And then the Assyrians, especially after the reign of Tiglath-Pileser III in the 8th century BCE, he created a system that was effective and, um, and continued to be copied by subsequent empires. So the system of empire that you then see being used by the Persians and later by the Hellenistic Greeks and the Romans, it all, you can trace it back to the, the Neo-Assyrian empire of the 8th century. Um, things like setting up garrisons around the empire so that if there's a rebellion, you can address it immediately. Um, building roads to connect the parts of the empire so that messages could be transferred quickly. Um, having governors of provinces who have particular responsibilities to the king and to their, and to their province. There's a whole lot of things that these Assyrian kings set up and that then continued. So I think it's the first successful empire i think it's uh coming you know hundreds and hundreds of years after the first attempts at empire but it's the first really successful one and it's the one that yes was then um emulated by later kingdoms but it was also brutal in some ways that the way that the assyrians um controlled the empire the kings emphasized unlike going back to our first king that we talked about ornama where he was emphasizing in his royal inscriptions how good he was to his people the Assyrian kings made a habit of writing inscriptions that were about how they in, in still, they instilled terror into their populations, how people were in fear of the king, that they were in fear of the army, and that there was this sort of sense that the empire was held together in part by fear of what the army would do if you rebelled. And, um, and so in that way, it was, it was different from some of the earlier empires. What caused the collapse of Assyria in Syria in the end? Yeah, the Assyrian Empire in um, between sort of 612 uh, and 609, 605, people give different dates for the end of it, BCE. 
the Assyrian Empire did collapse. And it's one of those times where, where some empires, when they collapse, it's like a gradual process. And you think, well, when did it actually happen? The Assyrian collapse was really quite dramatic. Um, it happened because of a rebellion, first by the Babylonians, who had been subject to Assyria, who were joined uh, by a group of people called the Medes, who lived in what is now Persia. And the Babylonians and the Medes joined forces and were able to fight northwards into Assyria. Assyria, for hundreds of years before this, hadn't actually been attacked, and uh, it had been attacking other, other kingdoms. But it was weakened as a result of a civil war that had taken place between two claimants to the throne. Um, so Assyria was weak enough that the Babylonians and the Medes were able to march into Assyria and conquer one capital city after another. They made it to Nineveh, which was the, um, the great capital. And it's clear from excavations at Nineveh that they were not prepared for, I mean, they hadn't even thought in sort of the construction of the city wall that it might actually come under attack. So they had these big wide gates and the, the gates were narrowed as they, by sort of emergency construction to try and keep out the invaders, but they weren't successful. The capital city then moved to a, a place called Haran in Syria, but that too was captured. And then that was it for this Assyrian empire. It was divided between the Medes who controlled the North and the Babylonians who controlled the South. There were still people living in Assyria, but um, but the Assyrian Empire was 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 gone. Mm. Uh, do forgive me for jumping a little bit. I'm going to jump ahead and going to go back to get to Babylon, but I want to talk a little bit about the Neo Assyrian Empire as well. Before... Well, this was the Neo Assyrian Empire. When oh, I right. talked about the Assyrian Empire, that is the Neo Assyrian oh, Empire. Oh right, that was there was... no worries. There yeah. was a, there was a Middle Assyrian Empire which I didn't talk about, which was earlier. Um, it was in the late Bronze Age, in the 14th to the 12th century BC, and it was imperialistic. But like those other earlier empires, it wasn't as successful as the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which is the one we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, actually really interestingly, before, long before this, in the 19th century BC, Assyria was a place. There was a city called Ashur, which is where we get the term Assyria. And it had some of the weakest kings in all of Mesopotamia at the time. These kings were basically overruled by a council of elders. So you have a kingdom that starts out in the 19th century, very weak kingship, very strong um, assembly that made decisions and a very, very strong um, merchant class who were uh, trading to the middle Assyrian period where the kings become much more powerful to the neo Assyrian period, period that, where it dominated the entire Middle East where the kings were enormously powerful. So it's it's a sort of gradual in, increase in the in the power of kings. Now, I know you've been looking forward to this because we have to, of course, as we talked about the ancient Near East, we have to talk about Babylon. And we have to, I want to especially, of course, talk about Hammurabi, the famous Lord of us. And let's talk about the Babylonian kingdom and, and especially highlight Hammurabi. Okay, yes. So as in the case of Assyria, you have a time when Babylon was not a powerful place. So um, at the same time that, that Ashur and Syria had these weak kings, Babylon was a small kingdom um, in the Euphrates region in what is now Iraq. Um, um, it's, uh, it, was, it had um, kings who were Amorites. They, this was a particular um, language that was spoken in the region. And they, these kings were initially probably considered foreigners, but very, very soon were considered just locals, but they had Amorite names. And for several generations, Babylon was insignificant in comparison with the other kingdoms around it. Hammurabi came to the throne in 1792 BCE. And for the first 30 years of his reign, he too was not a particularly powerful king. He was very much like his grandfather and his great grandfather. Um, but in his 30th year, uh, he began to be imperialistic for reasons that, complicated reasons, but one is that that his kingdom was attacked and he was in a, a group of allies who managed to fight off this attack from a place called Elam, which is in now in Iran. And he seems to have gotten a taste for warfare that he didn't have before. And he began to expand to the south, conquering a kingdom called Larsa that had been there for a very, very long time. He starts fighting to the north and he conquers uh, a kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Mari that I've mentioned before. And so he becomes a king of a territorial state that is sometimes described as an empire that extended over almost all of what is now Iraq and a little bit of Syria. 
at that point, he then, very late in his reign, put out these laws, um, uh, promulgated a, a, a collection of laws that he had inscribed on big stone monuments, big, big stone stealers, of which one has been found, but we know that there were others. And he had them put up around the, his, his empire, his kingdom, extended kingdom, as a way of showing people that he was king and that he had the right to rule. The top of this stele has a beautiful image, beautifully carved image of the seated god Shamash and Hammurabi standing in front of him. And Hammurabi has his hand in prayer, in sort of a prayer position, and Shamash is handing him a rod and a ring, which were Sim they symbolized legitimacy, they symbolized kingship. So you have the right to rule Hammurabi and Hammurabi is praying to him. So he's sort of with this image, even if you couldn't read the stele, you could see, ah, here's our king and he has this power given to him by the gods. Under that is this huge, beautifully, beautifully written collection of laws, almost 300 of them, that he said he was going to use to rule his empire. It starts with a prologue, very much like Ornama, describing what a great guy he is. It ends with an epilogue, again, saying what a great guy he is. And it says in there, if anyone has a, um, a case that they want to take to court, let them come and see my laws and see what uh, if they have a case, if they have the right to go to court. These laws were found in 1902. And when they were discovered, they were thought to be the first laws ever. They aren't. Ornama's laws are earlier, but those hadn't been found yet. So it, it was another of those cases where it gets into the news and there's an enormous amount of interest, the earliest laws on earth. And ever since then, Hammurabi has been a famous person. But, if, I, if I may interrupt you, Jan, I, yeah. I, want, I want to add a question. That we know that Please. it was not Hammurabi, but earlier law. Do we know if, if there's even an earlier law universe that, we ha that, as you said, have not been discovered yet, that could be even you know earlier laws? It's possible because we only have what we have because it's been found in the ground. So you can never say never, right? Perhaps they'll mm -hmm. find uh, an earlier collection of laws from someone before Ornama, but it hasn't been found yet. Um, so for now, Ornama is the earliest. But yeah, that's the thing about ancient Mesopotamia is that if it hasn't come out of the ground, we don't know about it. It's it, There are some things, of course, that were legendary and that were kept alive as, as stories in subsequent generations. But there are some, there have been some surprises always. So it could be, yeah, possible that there's another one. That's why the earliest extant laws are by Ornama and definitely not by Hammurabi. But because he was this big name when he was discovered, he got into the textbooks then and he has stayed in the textbooks. And I actually say in my book, I think he'd be surprised. I don't think Hammurabi, if he was going to um, come back sort of time machine wise, would have guessed that he would be the name everyone would remember. There was a king who was alive during uh, the beginning of his reign named Rim Sin, who'd ruled for 60 years. He was a huge name. Most people don't remember Rim Sin. Um, Sargon, who is remembered, was a big name in his time. There were, there were a lot of kings that he would probably have thought, it was a surprise, why me? Um, but on the other hand, uh, he certainly wanted to be remembered. His, his steles were an attempt at that, the, the monumentality of them and the fact that he put them up in these um, in the cities. Uh, I think all the kings wanted to be remembered, but he did a particularly good job of it. And he does seem to have done a good job of ruling his kingdom. He was uh, successful in maintaining it for the rest of his life, and he ruled for 43 years. He had a very long reign compared to most people. He must have lived into at least his 60s. And during that time, he... Um, set up administrative structures in the various kingdoms uh, that he had, had conquered, which became provinces. And there's evidence from letters that he wrote that he was very hands-on. Lots of his correspondence survives. And he wrote to his officials and he would write about something as mundane as a particular orchard uh, has been given to the wrong man and this orchard belongs to so-and-so and you need to make sure that so-and-so gets his orchard back because he complained to me and he does have a right to this orchard. I mean, really micromanaging. And um, but that said, it was it stayed together. It was a successful um, state. And then in his son's reign, things began to fall apart. So the empire began to collapse, certainly in the south, in the reign of his son, whose name was Samsuelona. Do you forgive me if I'm jumping back and forth again? But I, That's I, right. remember, I remember one part that you wrote that I found really fascinating. I want to bring up uh, is recruitment to the army and how 
the soldiers were taken care of because that's and how their families were taken care of as well. That's a part that I wanted to bring up as well because that was really fascinating to me how they seem, yeah. actually seem to take care of the families of the army. Yes, and that we know very well from Hammurabi's time. It's mentioned in his laws. There are a lot of laws that pertain to these soldiers. And it's also known from contracts that survive and from letters that the soldiers would write and letters that were written by the king to um, a man whose name was Shamash Hazir, who was responsible for giving out land to these soldiers. And the way it worked was, if you were going to fight for the king, you would only be doing it for three months out of the year. So it wasn't a, he didn't have a standing army in the way that we do now where it's a year round profession. He had some people who worked for him year round in the army, but the mass of the army was only available three months out of the year. And that's because most of the year they were farmers, they were uh, maintaining farms. But the way that Hammurabi paid them was that he provided them with farmland for their families. It was called an ilkum. And if you were a soldier, you were given an ilkum and you had a little house on it and you had your family who lived there, you worked the land. And then during the season when you weren't farming, which was three months out of the year between harvest and sowing, that's the time that they would fight. And that's when the army would go off on campaign and you would be called up on your ilkum duty to the, the sol as a soldier and you would go off and fight on campaign. And there were laws, it's unclear to what extent these laws were followed, but Hammurabi tried to control this. So for example, he had a law that an Ilkum soldier could not hire someone to replace him. He had to go up on campaign himself. Well, and it was on pain. What a punishment if you paid someone that, to do the service for you? According to the laws, you were put to death for it. But we know from other records that that didn't happen at all, that they weren't put to death for it. And in fact, people did it on a regular basis that they would hire someone to take their place. And so I think it was an attempt by Hammurabi to try to keep the soldiers you know, um, that he had control over to actually come. Um, they certainly might, there might have been other penalties. As far as we know, it wasn't the death penalty actually being enacted. But those soldiers, though, they benefited. They had a way of supporting their family. And if a soldier was taken hostage uh, for ransom by the enemy, there were laws that pertain to the fact that his wife and son or children uh, could maintain part of the ilkum until his return. Um, or if his son was old enough, he could take over his father's military service and he could then farm the whole land that the father had been given. So there was a recognition that you couldn't simply, if a soldier was taken hostage, throw the family off the land, that they had in some ways a right to continue to farm it. They didn't own it. They couldn't sell it. Um, that was absolute. They definitely, the Ilkham belonged to the king well, and he well, could give it to someone else. In a way. Not exactly. That when you make par when one makes parallels to medieval Europe, there's always a way in which it gets sort of um, confused because there is no lord of the manor between these Ilkham soldiers and the king. Um, it's not a, a feudal system in that way. The king directly sort of controls these soldiers. He calls them up directly rather than having some knight sort of getting his serfs involved or something like that. But, so it isn't it isn't serfdom, um, but it is a way that the king controls a lot of land and uses it as a way to provide for his population. And he's not alienating it; he's not giving it to them. He is. Um, they get the the use of it. They get the, to farm it, but it's it still belongs to the king. It's so similar though because they do not own the land, and like you said, they kind of sell the land, and there's mm -hmm. they have to be kind of be there. So it sounds, sounds really similar, even though it's it is. It is. I just sort of shy away from those kind of like mm. uh, the, the parallels, because when you look into it, the differences are so profound. Mm. So uh, but uh, um, there, there is a similarity in the sense that, yes, the king is in control of land that he is using for purposes of um, mm. getting his soldiers to fight for him. Yeah. Mm. Now, the last thing, and I know you been you, you've been hesitant in using these terms yourself in the book, and that's why you wait so long with introducing them. And that is, of course, I, I, the sea people. And I want to end this episode with discussing the sea people. And we do, to some extent, discuss them in our episode on the 1177 BC. With, as, uh, but, you know, it's, it is 
Uh, do we are they what caused the collapse of I want to ask here as well, we discussed like I said, we discussed it earlier in an episode, but I want to talk here to hear your opinion on the collapse of civilization as it's called. Yes. Well, um, you talk to the right person. If you've already talked to Eric Klein, he is mm -hmm. the man to, to talk to. And his book, of course, is, is uh, brilliant, as is his um, after 1177 uh, BC book, which has just come out. Very, He's an excellent scholar on this. Um, I'm not looking at it. When I look at the end of the Late Bronze Age in this book, I'm more interested in the continuity than in that collapse. It's not the collapse. It's a wonderful title, but it's not the collapse of civilization. Uh, what happened yeah, was we this is that this as is, well, right? It's it's yeah. in the middle, right? There is before this time, and this is all happening as as the as Eric's title um, says, 1177. It's right around the end of the 12th century BCE, um, and as he himself says, the 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 year is a little bit arbitrary. 1177 it isn't it wasn't a final, but what happened, of course, was that. And again, for, for the listeners or viewers, the, we're going past Hammurabi's time here, yeah. but before the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So after the time of Hammurabi, there's a period called the Late Bronze Age, which lasted from about 1600 to about 1200 BCE. And it was a time of great prosperity. It was a time of huge amounts of international trade. It was a time when there was a peace between the, the great powers. Um, and um, I, I actually wrote a, a book that is largely about this called Brotherhood of Kings. But that period was a, a time that's really remarkable in world history. And it came to an end. It came to an end at the end of the 12th century mm. with, um, uh, oh, sorry, the beginning of the 12th century, it was by the end of the 12th century, it was completely over. So beginning of the 12th century is 1177. Um, by the end of the, the 12th century, it's really, it's really done. But in that time period, there was a collapse of the great powers, which left this power vacuum, which in the end was um, taken over by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So the Neo-Assyrians were in a way able to build their giant empire because this collapse had happened. What caused the collapse? I think uh, I am very much in, in agreement with, um, with Eric Klein that it was many factors, that mm -hmm. anyone who says it was the sea peoples, or it was an epidemic, or it was climate change, or it was, you know, if you're naming one factor, you're kind of losing parts of this big, big cascading sort of domino effect that took place. There were, um, what was the trigger? I don't know, you know, which one of these things was the first thing to start going wrong. But I think what's really striking is to see how difficult it was for that very stable world to come back. In fact, impossible. They, it never came back in the way it was uh, prior to that, because you had these five great powers that were pretty evenly balanced in terms of their um, their wealth, um, their power, their military. This was Egypt was one of them. This kingdom called Mitanni, uh, Hatti, which was the king of the Hittites, Babylonia, later Assyria. These were were great powers and they they were really had worked out a system where they didn't need to fight one another mm. that never came back once you have that collapse around 1177 have a period of small kingdoms and then the the neo-assyrian empire begins to sort of roar onto the scene um, conquering these smaller kingdoms that just didn't have any way of really uh, mm. fighting back so it's it's an important moment, and I do think it's it's a sort of multi causality. You mentioned the Sea Peoples. That's the the um, there were people who moved. Certainly, they were fighters. They were refugees. They moved from the north uh, of the Mediterranean to Egypt, and they caused devastation. But there was lots of devastation that was caused by people other than the Sea Peoples. And the Sea Peoples, some of them showed up in wagons with wives and children um, who weren't necessarily fighting. So it was a complicated time. Do we know if the sea, I mean, kind of this just as last with Eric Klein as well, but do we know if the sea people were actually real people? I mean, we, discussed, we don't really have any archaeological evidence. We only have a, a few descriptions. Of course, they weren't called. The sea people is more a modern name for them, I, I believe, but do we know it, they really existed at all, or are they more myth semi mythological people? You know, no, like... no, no, they were real. No, they, they absolutely were real. Um, uh, Ramses the uh, Third, sorry, no, um, 
yes, Ramses III, on the on the walls of his his uh, mortuary temple, has these images of these battle scenes um, that were clearly, yeah, based on reality. There was indeed battles, and we they he names the people, the Palisette, the Equesh, the uh, Danano. There, there's all of these names of different people, some of whom were described as having come from the sea, and some who came from. Uh, apparently came over land and didn't necessarily come from, uh, you know, by sea. Um, they got lumped together as sea peoples by early scholars and they've kept that name. But uh, no, they weren't mythological. They were real. And in fact, excavations in Palestine have found uh, evidence of a, a different material culture that wasn't Canaanite that was brought by these um, sea peoples that uh, resembles Mycenaean uh, the, the pottery re resembled Mycenaean pottery. So it was quite possible that some of them came from Greece or from uh, Cyprus. So yes, they were real. But uh, the um, I, I, going back to your first question about propaganda and that uh, inscription that I was talking about from Ornama, Ramses III was also full of propaganda. Of course, he wanted to show himself all powerful and great and so forth. But he wasn't making it up. No, there was a real there was a real battle against real people, and those people do seem to have moved for the reasons that refugees move. That there was life had become intolerable in the place where they were living, whether because of famine, because of disease, because of civil war. They, they were people who who were coming to Egypt, hoping to be able to settle there, apparently, and uh, were unsuccessful. And so, but they did uh, settle throughout what is now. Uh, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Syria. I think we did the um, round about the uh, you salvage from coming on the podcast. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you about the ancient areas. Of course, before I go, where can people find your book, Weavers, Scribes, and King? If they want to read more about the ancient areas, which you absolutely should absolutely read, it's a brilliant insight into not just the royalty, but also the common people of the ancient areas. And do you have any social media you want to share or where can people find you if they have further questions about? Yes, please. Um, uh, again, my last name is spelled Padani, P-O-D-A-N-Y. And I am on um, uh, the platform that used to be called Twitter, uh, X. Um, I am also on Instagram and I have a page on, probably the best place to find me is on academia.edu, which has uh, all of my, it has a number of my, um, articles that you can read there and and links to the books that I've written in addition to Weaver, Scribes and Kings. So that's uh, academia.edu and it's Amanda Padani, P-O-D-A-N-Y. Thank you so much again for coming on. It's been a great pleasure to have you. This has been well, that aged well. You can find us on Twitter slash X on the well, that aged well. We are on Instagram as well and well, that aged well. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on Spotify, consider giving us five stars. You can give us one if you hate this podcast. It's up to you. In the end, it's a free country, at least on this side of the world. You, that file will be, of course, pressed below. If you're on Apple Podcast, consider writing a review, and that will be very nice. If you're on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. My name is Adam. This has been when that aged well. I'll see you next time.